All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So the, the plan for today, uh, as I mentioned uh, in the previous lecture, is to uh, spend the, the whole lecture today talking about uh, optical flow. Uh, so this is one particular problem in computer vision that has like particular relevance to, to robotics, as I'll uh, explain in, in a bit. Um, so I guess here's what we mean by uh, optical flow. Uh, so we have some sequence of images, so video uh, that's playing on the, the right. Uh, so the camera here is, is just uh, static. Um, and what we're looking at at every pixel is the apparent motion in the image. Uh, so if you look at just some kind of corners of the, the video, uh, these vectors are, are, have like very small magnitude. If you look, if you look at uh, portions that correspond to the, the car uh, or, or the trucks that are kind of passing by, uh, you can see that the uh, arrows at every pixel have larger magnitude. Uh, so the direction uh, corresponds to the direction of the apparent motion. Uh, and the magnitude corresponds to the, the magnitude of the apparent motion. And on the left is, is just the, uh, the magnitude of the motion that, that's being uh, visualized. Uh, so you can see portions where the car is moving have a higher uh, magnitude of uh, optical flow. Uh, and yeah, I guess uh, as we mentioned a, a couple of times before, uh, optical flow is really crucial for the operation of drones. Uh, so all of our crazy flies, other drones as well, have this downward facing uh, camera uh, that is doing some kind of computation similar to, to what we saw on the, on the previous slide, uh, to basically estimate the drone's uh, velocity. Uh, and as part of this assignment uh, that's due next week, you'll see uh, exactly how that uh, computation works, how you can use optical flow uh, to figure out the, the drone's uh, velocity. Question? Uh, why aren't like, accelerometers used or anything? Yeah, so you could use accelerometers. Uh, what you need to do then is integrate the acceleration um, to get the, the velocity. And then if you want to get position, then you integrate that again. Uh, so if your acceleration me measurements are a little bit noisy or, or slightly wrong, if you do that integration twice, uh, then that uh, compounds the errors, and so you get a, a larger error in, in velocity or position. Uh, with optical flow, you're kind of measuring the velocity uh, like more directly, uh, and so there's one step less of uh, like error propagation that happens uh, if you want to get uh, positions. Or of course, if you want to get velocities, then, then you directly get that out of uh, optical flow. Yep, good question. Okay. Um, all right, so I guess here's a kind of pictorial description of, of what we're trying to do. So we have some image uh, at some time t. Um, let's say it's a grayscale image. It could be a RGB image. So i, x, y, t uh, is the intensity of light uh, at pixel location x, uh, y, uh, and at time t, if we're looking at a grayscale image. Uh, and then we have a corresponding image uh, at the, the next time step. Uh, so t plus 1 is the, the next time step. Uh, and in this uh, kind of sequence, from t to t plus 1, uh, some of the objects in the scene have moved around. Uh, and what we're trying to estimate uh, is for each pixel, uh, we want to estimate like where things in the, the scene uh, kind of seem to have moved uh, from, from the previous time step to the, the current uh, time step. So yeah, we want to do this for every pixel. So uh, estimate the, the pixel motion uh, from image uh, at time t to image at time uh, t plus 1. OK, so I guess what I want to emphasize really is, is uh, optical flow is the apparent uh, motion of objects. Uh, so it's not necessarily the, the actual uh, motion of, of objects in the scene. Uh, and just, just to kind of hammer this home, let's think about a couple of examples. So can you think of examples where uh, there's no optical flow? Uh, so no apparent motion, but there is actually relative motion. So you have a camera that's looking at some environment. Uh, the camera is moving relative to the environment, uh, but there's no, uh, no optical flow, like zero optical flow, uh, let's say like everywhere or maybe in, in some portion of the, the image. So what's an example of, of that? Go ahead. Maybe the camera's inside of the car looking in the car, um, facing outside like it's looking against a chair or something. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so I guess in that case, there's no relative motion between the camera and the car, uh, but there is relative motion between the, the camera and, and the, the outside world. Uh, other examples? It's pretty contrived, like going down a hallway, yeah. it's like totally blank. Like yep. You can be able to tell. Good, yeah. So if your camera is moving in a completely textureless environment, uh, so an extreme version of this is you just place your camera in front of a blank wall, uh, you move the camera around, uh, no matter where the camera is, it sees exactly the same scene because there is no, uh, no texture. Um, OK, so I guess another, let, let's think about the other case. Uh, so there's no relative motion uh, between the camera and its environment, uh, but there is optical flow. Go ahead. Uh, 
source? Yes, yeah, perfect. So, so changing uh, light source, changing intensity, or, or the, the sun, or, or some other uh, source of light is, is moving around. Uh, in that case, uh, the camera is fixed relative to the environment, but uh, you could uh, still see uh, like changes in the image uh, because of the, the changes in the, the lighting. Okay, so apparent motion uh, could be due to lots of different factors. So it could be, I guess the most direct one is that the camera is actually moving relative to the, uh, the environment, uh, or the environment is moving relative to the, the camera, uh, or, or lighting uh, changes. Okay, so optical flow actually is, uh, seems to be a, a really crucial element, not just for robots, but also for uh, biological uh, systems. So there's a couple of really interesting uh, videos The audio seems. When you see a bird okay. zipping easily through the trees or landing gracefully on a tiny telephone wire, it can seem like it's performing a great acrobatic feat. Just how does it pull off those complicated maneuvers at such high speeds? It turns out that birds rely on a trick of the eye that even humans can perform. They're using something called optic flow. Optic flow is the way our eyes perceive motion as we travel through a landscape. For example, it's the illusion that trees and buildings are passing us by as we drive down a city street. The greater the optic flow, the faster things appear to be moving. Along with his colleagues at the Queensland Brain Institute, Partha Bakabatula, then a graduate student with the Australian National University, performed a series of experiments testing how birds take advantage of optic flow. A recreation shown here was performed by a starling, but they originally used a budgie. First, they trained a bird to fly through a narrow corridor with either horizontal or vertical lines painted on the walls. Flying by the vertical lines should give the appearance of more movement, creating greater optic flow. In both cases, the birds wound up flying straight down the center of the corridor, but when the lines were vertical, they flew slower indicating that they adjusted their speed based on the amount of motion they perceived. The scientists then had the birds fly through a corridor with one vertical wall and one horizontal wall. In this case, the birds didn't fly straight down the middle of the corridor. Instead, they flew closer to the wall with the horizontal stripes. But why? It turns out that flying farther away from the vertical stripes decreased the apparent speed on that side. So the scientists think that in order to avoid collisions, birds try to keep the same amount of optic flow in both their eyes. But the researchers didn't stop there. They then had the birds fly through yet another corridor, this time with one vertical wall and one completely blank wall. The birds still steered clear of the striped wall, but this time so much so that they occasionally collided with the blank one. The results of these experiments show that birds use optic flow to fine-tune their navigation when maneuvering through narrow spaces at high speeds. Understanding how birds make these delicate modifications could have major implications in the real world. It could help us build better flight navigation systems for man-made flying machines. Or it could help us create structures, like wind turbines and skyscrapers, that are more visible to birds so they can keep on soaring. All right, yeah, so it's pretty, pretty interesting that uh, birds basically like balance the amount of optical flow and, and use that for, for doing uh, obstacle avoidance or, or navigation. Uh, and you'll see an example, uh, not exactly that, but, but something similar to that in the, the current uh, assignment. Which might be the adorable <laughs> <laughs> This is a different video, <laughs> not related to what we were talking about. Yeah, so uh, the other thing that optical flow allows you to do is, is uh, figure out the time to collision to, a, to an obstacle. So if you're moving at some obstacle, uh, the optical flow around that obstacle allows you to figure out uh, how quickly you're going to hit the obstacle if you keep moving in that direction. And th that's something you've seen in this assignment. Uh, there's actually another really interesting example of using optical flow uh, in kind of biology. So this is uh, David Attenborough, one of his videos. Uh, it's just about like two minutes. I'll, I'll let it play straight through. Creepy workers are able to send complex messages to one another. In the wild, they're sometimes less out in the open, but mankind has persuaded them to live and store their honey in hives. The colonist's heart is its queen. She is just a little bigger than her subjects and mother of them all.
In spring, when food stocks are low, the workers get busy collecting nectar. direction uh, corresponds to, uh, to theta. Uh, the way people uh, kind of figure this out is, is also pretty interesting. So there's kind of like decades of uh, experiments on bees uh, trying to understand exactly how they uh, communicate. Uh, this is one paper. Uh, but one thing they did was um, basically change the amount of optical flow that the, the bees see. Um, so the, the queen bee goes somewhere, comes back, uh, and I guess she sees like a certain amount of optical flow. Uh, but then, uh, before the other bees uh, uh, kind of go on, on their flight, uh, they change the, the, the amount of texture uh, like in that uh, like area. Uh, and so if you increase the amount of texture, then the, the other bees uh, travel a, a smaller distance um, to, to see the, the same amount of, uh, of optical flow. So I guess that's kind of how they uh, figure out um, that bees are, are uh, kind of communicating the, the amount of uh, optical flow. Uh, to tell the other bees where to where to go. Uh, questions on I guess either of these. Go ahead. You said the bees change the texture. How? Um, so sorry, the the experimenters uh, change the uh, the amount of texture uh, to yeah to figure out uh, that the, the bees are, are communicating uh, optical flow. Yeah, uh, I guess that would that would also be impressive. But <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Other questions. Okay, so yeah, I guess let's switch to the, the blackboard. I'll switch back and, and show some videos later. All right, so just for uh, simplicity, uh, we're going to work with grayscale images. You can do exactly the same thing with RGB images as well. Uh, but things are a bit, a bit simpler uh, if we're just using uh, grayscale images. So grayscale, again, each pixel has a, a scalar associated with it. Uh, corresponding to the intensity of light at that pixel. Uh, and we're going to represent an image by i, uh, x, y, t. So basically, an image is a function uh, that takes in three parameters. So the x location of the pixel, the y location of the pixel, and the, the time, uh, and outputs and intensity value. So i, x, y, t is the intensity of light. Maybe I'll just write it down here, intensity. Uh, and x, y is the pixel location. Uh, and the, the goal is to, to estimate the uh, optical flow. Uh, 
at every pixel. So at each pixel location, we want to end up with a, a vector uh, that corresponds to the, the apparent motion at that pixel, uh, going from time t to, to time uh, t plus 1. Um, and so yeah, if we have some object in the scene uh, over here, another object over here, uh, let's say another object over here, uh, let's say between time uh, t and t plus 1 in one time step, uh, this object maybe moves over here, this object moves here, uh, this object moves over here. Uh, so at these three pixels, uh, this is the, the vector we want to, uh, to estimate. Uh, and in this scene, I guess if you assume like nothing else has moved, uh, then at all the other locations uh, away from these obstacles, uh, the optical flow is, uh, is just equal to, uh, to zero. Okay, we're going to make two assumptions. Let me write them out over here. So as I mentioned, I guess this lecture we're doing things in kind of an old school way. We're going to think hard about the problem, make some assumptions, uh, do some math, come up with an algorithm, uh, as opposed to the, the learning-based uh, approaches, which we'll start discussing uh, in the, the next uh, lecture. Uh, the first assumption is what's known as uh, intensity, or if you're working with color uh, images, then color uh, constancy. Uh, and intuitively, what this means is that if you have some point in the, the scene um, at time uh, t, it looks the same uh, at time t plus 1. Uh, so basically, if you have some object, let's, let's look at uh, this particular object uh, that's moved from uh, this location to that location uh, in a single time step, uh, then then it looks uh, it looks the same. So it's not like um, the intensity of light uh, here uh, is very different from the the intensities of uh, of light uh, like at uh, at the, the corresponding location at the, the next time step. So um, this assumption could be violated if you have uh, very drastic changes in the lighting. Uh, so if an object goes from shadow to not shadow, uh, then this assumption might be violated, but we're assuming that, uh, that, that, that it's valid. Um, the second assumption is going to be an assumption on small motion. So basically, the, uh, the amount of motion uh, between uh, two corresponding, or two, uh, sorry, uh, consecutive uh, frames, uh, t and t plus 1, uh, is not that large. Uh, so within a single time step, uh, it's not like objects are, are moving uh, massive amounts. Uh, and this could be a reasonable assumption if you have a, a high kind of frame rate uh, uh, camera, uh, then it's, it's reasonable to assume that within a single uh, frame, uh, things have not moved uh, all that much in the, the scene. All right, so these are the, the main assumptions we make. We'll add one more uh, later on. Uh, yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Actually, I think it might be easiest with a, a picture. So uh, I'll redraw the, the picture over here. So let's say we're just looking at one particular object. Um, that's this uh, disk over here. Uh, and at time step t, um, the location of the, the object is at uh, x and y. Um, yeah, I guess you can think of like that. The center of the, the object is, is at pixel location uh, x, y. Uh, at the next time step, uh, let's say it moves uh, a bit. I'm obviously exaggerating the, the amount of motion. Uh, in practice, assumption 2 is going to be uh, valid uh, or assumed to be valid. Uh, but yeah, let's say the, the amount of motion is, is kind of this much. Uh, so the optical flow uh, vector uh, at this location x, y uh, corresponds to this like change, right? So where did this object go from time step t to the time step t plus one? Um, so the location at the next time step is x plus u, uh, y plus v, where u v is the optical flow uh, vector uh, at that location uh, x and y. 
Um, so uh, the first assumption Uh, which is this intensity uh, constancy uh, or color constancy. Uh, mathematically, what it says is that <coughs> I, X, Y, T, so the intensity of light uh, at uh, location X, Y and at time T uh, is equal to the intensity of light uh, at this uh, location. Uh, so if you look at the, the intensity of light over here uh, at time set t, uh, then the intensity of light uh, over here uh, at time set t plus 1 is the, the same uh, as, as it was over here at, at time set t. Um, yeah, so I guess, does, does that uh, answer your question? Okay, good. Other questions on the assumptions? Go ahead. Okay, so the motion, uh, the relative motion of objects in the in the real world, like relative to the camera, could be anything. Uh, so it could be yeah, like fully kind of three dimensional motion. Um, what we are trying to do is just figure out the the apparent motion, uh, and that's purely in in the uh, the two dimensional like plane of the uh, the image. Uh, so we're not going to be able to at least directly from this. Uh, figure out how the object is moving in 3D. Uh, all we're trying to do is like figure out like where uh, the object uh, seems to have moved uh, just in the the image plane. Good. Other questions? Go ahead. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, good. Yeah. Thanks. Go ahead. Yeah, the frame rate per, the frame rate is, is high enough. Um, like, and I guess high enough uh, kind of depends on how quickly things in the, the scene are, are moving. Uh, so you could have a slow frame rate, but then you could assume that things in the scene are moving like very very slowly too. Okay. All right. So that's yeah. Let's uh, label this equation. I'll call this equation one. Um, <clears throat> so if assumption two is satisfied. So objects are, are not moving that much uh, between uh, like consecutive images. Uh, then we can tailor expand the right hand side of uh, of one. <coughs> uh, so let's do that. So I. Uh, x plus u, y plus v, uh, t plus 1. Uh, if we tailor expand this, if we think of this as a function of x, y, and, and, and t, um, this is approximately equal to uh, the, the function value uh, at x, y, and t uh, plus i, x, x plus i, y, y plus uh, i, uh, t, where uh, I'm just using this uh, shorthand, so i x is the uh, image intensity uh, derivative, uh, the partial like derivative uh, along the x direction uh, evaluated at, at x. So at the, the pixel location x, or I should say x, y, t. Uh, and similarly, i, y, uh, I'm using a shorthand for the intensity uh, derivative along the y direction, uh, and i, t is the partial uh, derivative of the intensity uh, with respect to time. 
so let's just think about uh, how one would obtain these, uh, and I guess intuitively what they mean. So let's say we have some image um, that has some object over here. Uh, so how would you uh, either compute or, or estimate uh, this quantity, so ix? So let's just pick some particular uh, pixel uh, location. Let me just draw this a bit bigger. Uh, so some pixel over here. Uh, if you had a particular image or, or a, uh, like two images at time t and t plus one, um, how would you calculate or estimate ix? So intuitively, again, what it means is that it's the, uh, the derivative, so the partial derivative of the intensity along the, the x direction. x is, is this way, y is this way. Uh, so how would, you, how would you estimate that for a particular image? Yep, yeah, exactly. So, so you can uh, look at the, uh, the difference in the intensity values uh, at neighboring pixels, right? So you can look at the pixel you're interested in, uh, you can look at its uh, pixel on the, the left uh, and the, the pixel on the right, uh, and just look at the, uh, the difference uh, between the intensity of light, let's say at, at this pixel, the left pixel, and the, the right pixel, uh, so R minus L, like that's, that's an approximation uh, of this intensity derivative along the x direction. So it's basically saying, uh, how is my intensity changing if I move a little bit in the, the x direction? Uh, there's other ways to, to do this. Uh, so you can yeah, just look at uh, right minus, uh, like the pixel on the right minus the pixel you're interested in, uh, or yeah, other, other kind of approximations where you look at larger windows. So it's the same kind of thing we were doing in the, uh, the previous lecture. Uh, you can do the, the same thing along y, um, so calculate the differences uh, in the intensity values along y, uh, and I guess maybe, maybe we can do one more. So it, so the partial derivative along time uh, at pixel location x, y, how would you calculate or, or estimate that? Um, uh, sorry, not for, 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 yeah, for why you do, you do that, uh, but I guess I, I meant for, for the time version, uh, how do you, how do you calculate that one? Go ahead, you have the answer. Uh, look at it between the frames. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you look at the, the image intensity at that pixel location at time t, you look at the uh, corresponding image intensity at time t plus one, look at the difference, uh, and that's, that's this uh, partial uh, derivative. All right, so yeah, I guess that's, that's our Taylor approximation, uh, which is going to be valid or approximately valid uh, if our second uh, assumption holds. So we can combine um, these two equations. <coughs> Actually, let me just label that equation over there. Let's call this equation two. All right, so from two, we can just rearrange it a bit. So I'm going to bring uh, one of the terms, so the first term, over to the, the left-hand side. So this is now approximately equal to i x uh, x. Uh, oh, sorry, I had a typo there. Uh, oops. Sorry, maybe this is partly why things were confusing, so this should be u and uh, v. 
uh, those are the, the uh, components of the, the optical flow. Uh, so it's not just x, I guess it's the, the change in x, right? Uh, so it's uh, the x at the, the uh, second time step, so that's x plus u, uh, y plus v minus uh, xy. Uh, so it's u and v uh, when you do the, the Taylor uh, expansion. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so uh, this uh, times u plus i y v uh, plus uh, the partial derivative uh, with respect to time. And the, the change in time is just 1, right? So it's t plus 1 minus t. Uh, so that's why there's no term uh, multiplying that. Um, and then this left-hand side over here, uh, if you look at our uh, assumption 1, uh, that tells us that this is equal to, to 0. Or we're assuming it's equal to, to 0. Uh, and so just kind of uh, modifying uh, this, we have i x u plus i y uh, v uh, plus uh, i t uh, is approximately equal to, to 0. Uh, and just rearranging this a, a bit, so the gradient uh, of i uh, dot product with u v uh, transpose uh, <coughs> is equal to plus it uh, is approximately equal to, to zero. Uh, and this gradient here, I guess just we can just define that. to be this vector of uh, ix and uh, iy. All right, any questions on this? OK, so all right, just to recap, so what are we trying to do? We're trying to figure out u and v, right? Uh, uh, that's the, uh, the optical flow vector at pixel x, y. Uh, and we're trying to do this just separately at every pixel. So for now, just imagine that we're focusing in on one particular uh, pixel location, x, y. Uh, so we get this uh, equation. Uh, so how many unknowns do we have? We have two unknowns, right? So u and v are scalars, uh, two unknowns. Uh, this is one scalar equation, right? The left-hand side, we're taking a dot product. That's a scalar it. That's a scalar right-hand side is a scalar. Uh, so we have two uh, scalar unknowns, uh, but only one uh, scalar equation. Uh, so this is not enough uh, for us to uh, uniquely solve for the optical flow vector uh, uv. Uh, question. Um, why do we have the transpose? Um, I guess, yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking of this as a, a column vector. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just a, a column vector. Yeah. Uh, so I, I wrote it as a row vector, but yeah, I guess I want, uh, I want it to be a, a column vector. Uh, yeah, it's not super important. Uh, yeah, it, it's just a, yeah, just the two dimensional vector with components u and v. Good. Other questions? Okay, so what exactly is going on? Like we have some uh, ambiguity. <coughs> in, uh, in figuring out uh, u and v, so we, we um, like just given the assumptions we made, we, we can't figure out uh, u and v. Uh, and specifically, uh, so this ambiguity is known as the aperture problem. Uh, so I'll show a video in, in just a minute that I think will uh, visualize this, but let me just go through the, uh, the math. Um, so let's say um, so let's call this equation uh, so this equation over here uh, let's call it equation 3 uh, this one uh, over here. So suppose the, the vector uh, u and v uh, satisfies Uh, equation three. Uh, so what I'm going to claim, so I'll prove this in, in just a second. Uh, the claim is that uh, u plus u prime, uh, v plus v prime, um, where U prime, uh, V prime 
uh, is some vector that is perpendicular uh, to the gradient uh, vector. Uh, so just pictorially, uh, if I have, let's say, the, the gradient vector uh, points in, in this direction, uh, suppose u v is some vector that points over here uh, that satisfies this, uh, this equation, equation 3. Uh, and u prime v prime is some vector, uh, any vector uh, that's perpendicular to the, this gradient uh, direction. Uh, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is that if u v satisfies uh, this equation, uh, then if I add in uh, u prime v prime, uh, that also satisfies uh, the, the equation. So let me just prove this quickly, and then we'll, we'll see kind of intuitively uh, what it means. Uh, so if you, um, so let's just plug it in. So gradient of i uh, dotted with u plus u prime, v plus uh, v prime, uh, plus uh, it equals uh, 0. Uh, then we can expand the, the dot product. Plus gradient of i dotted with u prime v prime. Um, sorry, not this is not equal to. I guess we're trying to prove that this is equal to, to zero. Uh, this is equal to zero by assumption, right? We're assuming that u and v uh, satisfies uh, equation three, uh, so that's, that's equal to, to zero. Uh, and then we're assuming that u prime v prime is perpendicular to the gradient, and so if you take the, the dot product, uh, this is also equal to, to zero. So we've uh, shown that uh, this vector, u, uh, u plus u prime, v plus v prime, uh, also satisfies uh, equation three. So I guess what does this mean? So it means that uh, motion that is perp perpendicular uh, to the gradient um, is not uh, resolvable given the, the assumptions we've made. Uh, and I'll show you a, a video, like I said, uh, in just a, a second. So, yeah, basically the intuition. Math is that the uh, any motion uh, that is perpendicular uh, to the gradient is not resolvable. Uh, given the uh, the assumptions uh, that we made. So let me show you, uh, yeah, questions on the, the map? Uh, not on the map. Okay. What does it mean to be uh, perpendicular to the gradient? Uh, perpendicular to the gradient? I guess I, I just mean kind of this picture. Uh, so the gradient vector uh, is what we defined over here. So it's the, the partial along x and the, the partial along y. So that's some vector like this. Yeah, this is some two-dimensional vector. Uh, so if we have motion or like a balance motion that's like perpendicular, so if an object is then moving in this direction, uh, that uh, component of the, the optical flow vector, uh, we are not going to be able to resolve um, uh, because we can add in any u prime and v prime, uh, and it still satisfies equation three, right? So, so there's an ambiguity uh, of the optical flow in that direction that's perpendicular to the, the gradient. Uh, I think a video hopefully is going to make things more clear. All right, so yeah, I guess this is the barbershop uh, illusion, if you've uh, seen these things uh, outside, uh, outside barbershops. Uh, so I'm going to play this clip, uh, I guess, three times. Uh, and I want you to focus on different parts of the video uh, each time. Uh, so the, the first time, focus on this portion of the, uh, the video. So that's the, the top kind of portion of the, uh, the L. Uh, so let me just play it. 
Yeah, and what you should notice is that things seem to be moving in a particular direction. So I guess which way do the people see the motion? So it's, yeah, it's that way. Okay, so that, that's one. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, now, all right, so the second time around, focus on this portion of the image. So that's the kind of vertical strip. And again, think about which way things seem to be moving. Uh, so it should seem that things are kind of moving up. All right, and then the, the final one, uh, focus on this kind of ellipsoidal uh, region. And yeah, I think you'll see that things seem to be moving kind of diagonally. Now if you get rid of the background, this red background, you see that there's actually just a bunch of lines that are all moving diagonally. Uh, except that of course that as well, that portion there too, we're look looking through an aperture, right? Like we're looking through like this rectangular uh, screen. Oops. Yeah, let me just play. So when the, the background goes away, it'll look like there's a, just a whole bunch of lines that are all moving in the same uh, direction, diagonally. Uh, but that, we're looking through this kind of rectangular uh, like aperture. Uh, right, so our human like minds are somehow resolving this ambiguity, right? Uh, so we think the motion uh, at the, the kind of top portion of the strip is to the left, uh, the vertical portion is up, and the, uh, the ellipsoidal region is kind of diagonal. Uh, so we're making like some assumptions uh, to resolve this uh, ambiguity question. Um, why is the vertical there? Is it like, is oh, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yes, okay, so the, the barber pole, uh, okay, I, yeah, so maybe there was a fourth one that I missed. So I guess keep an eye on the, the barber pole. So which way do you see things moving? So probably up, right? Uh, but actually, the the actual like motion uh, is like it's just spinning, right? It's not like uh, something is actually moving up. Uh, so uh, the spinning motion, when you just view it like this uh, through this aperture, like where you cut off the bottom and, and top portions, uh, it seems like things are moving uh, like just horizontally. Uh, so that portion, I guess, is similar to the vertical strip in the, the L uh, shape. Uh, good, yeah, thanks for, for asking that. Okay, all right, questions on, on this? All right, so basically to resolve this, this ambiguity, which is like fundamental, uh, given the assumptions we made, uh, we need to make some additional uh, assumption, which clearly like our, our minds are making some uh, assumption, right? Uh, because we see a particular uh, like direction of, uh, of motion. Question? Yeah, so this ambiguity um, is in, in this vector, like u prime, v prime. Uh -huh. um, we basically cannot, like just from this uh, one scalar equation, uh, we can't figure out uh, exactly what uh, u and v are, because we have like two unknowns, uh, u and v, uh, and just one, one equation. Uh, and yeah, the specific thing that we cannot figure out uh, is any uh, component of the motion that's perpendicular to the, the gradient. Uh, because if I add in any u prime and v prime, uh, if u v satisfies equation three, uh, then u plus u prime and v plus v prime uh, also satisfies uh, equation three. So I guess that's the, the specific uh, ambiguity. Yeah, the fact that we have two um, unknowns and just one equation. So we're going to have to make some assumption, like to get some additional uh, equation or equations. Uh, and the specific algorithm that we'll discuss, or the assumptions that we've made, so it's called the Lucas Canade uh, optical flow uh, algorithm. Uh, I'll describe kind of the, the most basic version, there are more refined uh, versions as well. The assumption we're going to make the extra assumption that will help us get an extra equation to resolve this ambiguity is known as spatial uh, coherence. Uh, and intuitively, uh, the, the assumption is that uh, a pixel's neighbors uh, have the same, uh, so a pixel's neighbors basically move together. Uh, so have 
the same optical flow. If we go back to this, this picture, uh, if we look at this specific uh, pixel that's kind of in the, the center of the object, that has some apparent uh, motion uh, that's given by UV. Uh, what we're assuming is that if you look at neighboring pixels, so if you look at some pixel uh, that's maybe over here or over here, uh, they all have the, the same uh, vector, like the same uh, UV. Uh, this is reasonable to a certain degree, like if you uh, have like rigid objects that are moving the scene. Uh, if you look at one particular point in the object, that has a particular uh, U and V. Uh, if you look at a neighboring point, it's reasonable to assume that has the same U and V. Uh, but it kind of breaks down around the, the boundaries of objects, right? If you look at uh, this point over here, uh, that's on the boundary of the object, and you uh, look at a neighboring pixel, uh, those are not going to have the same uh, U and V. Uh, so this is an assumption, it's, it's not perfect, but yeah, I guess we'll, we'll see. Uh, how far we can uh, we can get to it. Any questions on the assumption? All right. So what this assumption allows us to do is basically get a bunch more uh, equations. So we're going to look at let's say. Uh, Uh, five by five uh, window of pixels. Uh, around a particular pixel that we're interested in, which again, we're just calling x, y. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, let's say like this is a, a five by five uh, kind of image patch, so five by five uh, array of, uh, of pixels. Question? Does the spatial coherence mean that like, all pixels are moving at the same exact velocity. <laughs> yeah, so if you take it like totally seriously, right? Uh, like if, if a pixel uh, here is moving at a particular velocity, its neighbor is moving at the same velocity, its neighbor is, is moving at the same velocity, then the assumption is that, is that everything is moving at the, the same velocity. Uh, what's happening in practice is we're just looking at uh, a pixel uh, kind of in isolation, and we're trying to calculate uh, U and V for that pixel. Uh, and we're just assuming that uh, its neighboring pixels uh, are, are moving uh, like together with, uh, with this pixel. Um, so if we look at a, a different pixel, like a, a pixel that's on the, the boundary of some image, uh, this assumption is just not going to be satisfied. Uh, and our estimate of the optical flow at that uh, location on the, the boundary is going to be incorrect. Uh, so I guess that's what it means uh, kind of practically, is that uh, when the assumption is not satisfied uh, at some image, uh, like location of the, the, sorry, at some location of the image, then the optical flow vector we calculate is not going to be uh, correct. And I'll, I'll show you some uh, videos. <laughs> okay. okay. Does that answer the question? Okay. Good. All right. So yeah, let's let's just focus in on, on a particular pixel x and y, uh, and look at some five by five uh, batch of pixels uh, around the, the the x y pixel. Um, so what we have is basically, okay, let me, let me write it down. So we're going to end up with uh, 25 different uh, equations, scalar equations. That we can write as, as a, uh, a vector uh, equation. So each of each of these uh, each of the, the pixel uh, pixels in this five by five window, uh, we can apply this uh, equation three. Um, and what we're assuming, so without that assumption, like each pixel would have its corresponding uh, U and V. 
Uh, but we're, what we're assuming is that all of the, the pixels in this 5x5 five five batch have the exact same uh, U and V. Um, so at some pixel location, P1, uh, there's a particular image like gradient, Ix and Iy. At a different pixel location, there's a different Ix and Iy. Um, and if you, I guess if you multiply all of these, uh, or multiply these out, you have 25 uh, scalar equations, right? So each one is saying the uh, image uh, derivative uh, along the x direction times u, plus the image direct, uh, derivative uh, along the y direction uh, times v is equal to minus the uh, partial uh, along time. Question? Okay, what's the dimensions of the first matrix? Yeah, so this one is, so it has 25 rows. Uh, and two uh, columns. Uh, and this is a, a two by one, uh, and this is a 25 by, uh, by one. Uh, yeah, so we're just taking these scalar equations uh, at every uh, pixel, uh, and assuming that the, the u and v uh, are the, the same as at all the pixels, and we're just concatenating all of those scalar equations uh, to get 25 scalar equations, which we can just write kind of compactly uh, in this one question. So it, it seems like we're trying to solve for two variables in the problem. There yes. We only have one equation. Yeah. So why do we need 25? Yeah, so we don't really need uh, 25. Uh, so this is an over-determined uh, system. So yeah, we just have two unknowns. Uh, and yeah, we ended up with, uh, with 25 equations. Um, one way to think about this is that if you like we're trying to get some kind of like robust uh, solution. So we're trying to get something that will uh, satisfy uh, like these equations kind of as accurately as possible. Uh, and we can, actually let me just, uh, just define some uh, notations, notation here. So let's call that first uh, matrix, uh, we call it A. Uh, U and V, we can call it uh, D. Uh, bar and then uh, equal to uh, just B. Uh, yeah, I'm just, just defining the, the first matrix to be A, so this was the 25 uh, by 2 matrix, uh, this is a 2 by 1, uh, and this is a 25 by, uh, by 1. All right, so we have this over uh, determined uh, sequence of uh, uh, system of equations. Uh, so we can find a least square solution. So basically, find some uh, vector d, uh, some some u v uh, that minimizes this. So we saw this, uh, I guess, back in assignment one when we were trying to figure out the, the thrust coefficient uh, for the, the crazy fly uh, drones. Um, and yeah, there's an analytical solution, so you can just use like sci-fi for instance, but yeah, there's also an analytical solution, <coughs> uh, the least square solution, so this is D equals uh, A transpose A inverse uh, multiplied by A transpose uh, multiplied by B. Let's call this uh, equation four. Uh, so yeah, I guess this is the, the least square solution. What I mean is this vector uh, minimizes uh, this objective. So it, it tries to satisfy all of the equations as much as possible, uh, where as much as possible is like quantified by uh, this uh, objective. You look at the, the difference uh, in the altitude, like normal vector, uh, and, and square that. All right, so. Let's think about where, um, okay, so I guess we, so just to answer your question, we, we didn't need so many equations, uh, but uh, the rough intuition is that if we have uh, some like error uh, from like each uh, equation, if we have a bunch of equations and we're kind of approximately satisfy them, uh, then that can make us more like robust to, to like kind of little uh, pieces of noise if we have questions. What is the subscript to? The equation. Oh, like the, the L2 norm. Uh, so just the usual like uh, notion of, of distance, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, does, does that make sense? So, yeah, yeah Euclid and this is that's good. Okay. All right, so let's think about where this equation, uh, or where, where the solution exists and where it doesn't exist. So if we, uh, yeah, I guess the question is like, when can we solve this uh, equation when we get the, the least squares uh, solution? Uh, so we need uh, this matrix A transpose A uh, to be invertible. Right to uh, calculate and uh, this uh, this inverse over here. Um, yeah, we need this matrix uh, if and for to, to have an, an inverse. Uh, so if you look at uh, a transpose a, a again was just that uh, 25 by 2 uh, matrix over there. If you take its transpose multiply by itself, uh, you get a, a 2 by 2 matrix, right? So. Uh, 2 by 5, 2 by 25 times 25 by 2, so you get a, a 2 by 2 matrix. Um, and yeah, I guess you can maybe just do the uh, calculation uh, offline if you want to, but it ends up being uh, write that x squared. Each uh, summation here uh, is over the for each the pixel or pixels in the five by five image patch. So each like element of this 2 by 2 matrix, you sum over uh, each of the, the 25 pixels in your 5 by 5 patch. Uh, for this one, you calculate the ix at every uh, band, uh, sorry at, at every pixel, uh, square that, uh, and uh, and so on. Um, so for this matrix to be invertible, so is this a 2 by 2 matrix? We can look at its uh, determinant to, uh, to kind of see whether it's invertible or not. So the determinant, so it's invertible uh, if the determinant is not uh, equal to, to zero. So the problematic cases are where the determinant uh, is equal to zero. So the determinant of A transpose A, so it's just a two by true matrix, so we can write it out analytically. Yeah, so one case is when ix is equal to, to iy. Uh, so intuitively, uh, what that corresponds to, uh, actually, yeah, I guess you, does someone figure out uh, what does it correspond to intu intuitively? Like, what's, uh, what does it mean, like, visually for ix to be equal to, to iy? Go ahead. 45 degree. Yeah, so you have a, an edge. Uh, at a 45 degree uh, angle, um, so the the, the uh, image gradient is, is in this uh, uh, like direction. Um, <coughs> so yeah, I guess that, that's one uh, problematic case. Uh, other problematic cases. There's a simpler one actually. 
it doesn't move at all. Say again? There's no texture. Yeah, there's no texture. Uh, so everything is, is zero. So ix equals iy uh, equals zero for, for, all the, for all pixels. Like all pixels in this uh, five by five batch. Uh, in that case, each term here is zero, so the determinant is zero. Question? You don't need to fire one of them to be zero. Oh, yes, actually, uh, yeah, just one. Okay, so I guess either ix equals zero or. Either of those. Uh, go ahead. So is that 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 just means it's only moving in like uh, it's moving along an axis? Uh, yeah. So it's not the motion, right? So it's the uh, the image like gradient. Uh, so we have a edge basically that's that's like completely uh, vertical or uh, or completely uh, horizontal. So uh, in these cases, uh, like in, in this case, the uh, gradient along the y direction is equal to, to zero. Uh, so if you just look along the object, uh, nothing is changing. Uh, and similarly, uh, yeah, if you have uh, an edge kind of an object that, that's horizontally oriented, uh, then nothing is changing in, in this direction. Uh, so that's that's also equal to zero. Yeah. So it's basically where uh, if you move a little bit in the image, uh, the intensity of light is not changing that much. So if the object, let's say, was horizontal and was moving horizontally. Uh, and if you were just focusing on, let's say, this little kind of portion of the image over here, uh, so you have a horizontal object that's moving horizontally, you're not going to be able to figure that out, right, just by looking at that portion, because, um, yeah, the, uh, like everything kind of locally uh, seems, to be, uh, seems to be the same from image to, uh, to image. So yeah, these are, these are the, the problematic uh, scenarios. I guess questions on, on this? Okay, let's look at just visually. Yeah, yeah, but like intuitively. Yeah, so intuitively, uh, let me see. I don't think I have a. Um, yeah, I don't think I have an example. But uh, go ahead. Sorry. Any limitation like comes from the fact that we're looking specifically at like x y So, if you, for example, had an image that allowed us to find exact derivatives along like every not just x y but um, if, for example, I don't think that would solve the issue, right? You would still have, um, so if you had like some. Yeah, that's right. So I think the, okay, so I guess the intuition I have is if you have some, let's say like this is a, an object, uh, okay, this is better. So this is an object that, that uh, is like, has the same texture uh, like everywhere along it. Uh, so this is currently, uh, I mean, think of this as kind of like a, a horizontal like strip. Uh, so this is moving in, in this direction. Um, if you look at just this like location over here, if you kind of just like zoom in over here, uh, you're not going to see any uh, like any motion, um, and yeah, I guess if you're moving uh, like if it's oriented this way, if it's like a thin strip uh, that that's oriented uh, this way, like vertically, uh, then if you're moving in the vertical direction, uh, you won't see the uh, the motion. Um, so yeah, if you change the the orientation of the camera, uh, I don't think it changes anything fundamentally, right? Like there's still some direction where the object along which the object could be moving. Uh, where where you don't uh, pick up that apparent uh, motion, uh, is that right? Or, or I guess am I? Or, or do you? Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the image that you drew, yeah, um, it looks like I mean, like it would be easy, I feel like, to tell if an image is moving if you have like that background on it, right? Yeah. So if because, you because they're only looking at small yeah. areas. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good. So, so if you made the, the image patch larger, so instead of a 5x5 five five patch, let's say you're looking at like a 10x10 10 10 patch, like something that uh, goes beyond the, the kind of uh, boundary of the, the object, uh, then if we look at, uh, I guess it's partially included now, but uh, like if you look 
if you look at uh, like that determinant, uh, it won't necessarily be the case that uh, each ix uh, or iy is, is equal to zero because along the uh, the boundary of the object, uh, there's going to be some gradient, right, in, in the ix or, or iy uh, direction. Thank you. Good. Okay. Okay, so yeah, I guess when when does uh, Lucas Canale like this algorithm that we described have, have trouble? Um, so yeah, we discussed these uh, situations, but but just uh, to reiterate, if there's some portion of the image that that has like very low texture or no texture, uh, then that's uh, that, that's a kind of hard case. Uh, the other one was this uh, edge uh, where i x is, is equal to, to i y. Um, or, or the other ones where like one of the, the gradient directions is, is equal to, uh, to zero. Um, oops, sorry. Yeah, so I guess this is the, uh, the video again. Um, so here they're actually using some, uh, some tricks to, uh, to improve things. Uh, so you would expect that along the, uh, like the boundaries of the object, uh, things kind of uh, like break down, like the, the estimate that you that you, that you get is not uh, going to be exactly right. Here they're, uh, I think they're like doing some kind of like filtering. Um, so it's not just that they look at each pixel individually, but they're uh, like looking at like multiple uh, pixels, like doing this computation for multiple pixels and kind of like smoothing things. Uh, and I think you kind of see that over here. Like it's a bit like blurry, right? So the, the edges between uh, let's say a car uh, and and the the surrounding is not like completely, um, yeah, completely sharp. So I think they're doing some uh, like blurring, uh, like some smoothing uh, to to get rid of the the problems that the uh, the edges, uh, the, the boundaries of uh, of objects. Uh, but yeah, I guess just, just zooming out, like we made three assumptions, right? So the the first assumption uh, was the color constancy or or, uh, or intensity constancy. Uh, that assumption uh, like breaks if you have kind of drastic changes in, in lighting, uh, for instance, um, or if you have like yeah objects that are very reflective. Uh, then if you look at the object from one location and it moves a bit, uh, then the object might look very different even with with a, a small amount of motion. The second assumption was the uh, that the the motion is, is small, um, kind of compared to the, the frame rate. And the third assumption we made was the spatial coherence that. Basically, there are like rigid bodies in, in the, the world, and if you look at one uh, pixel, like neighboring pixels have the, the same uh, optical flow uh, vector. So if any of those assumptions break, uh, then we're not going to get good uh, estimates. Uh, so as part of this assi assignment, uh, I guess what you'll do is uh, install the cameras that we gave you uh, on the drone. So it should be pretty quick. Uh, I think Nate posted a, a video of him uh, putting it together. Uh, it took about like two minutes or so, so it should be relatively quick. Uh, you'll collect a, a video, um, so I guess you're, you're free to kind of choose your like environment, like move the, the drone around. Uh, you can do it in, in our uh, lab space, um, and then you'll use this algorithm, this Lucas Canade algorithm, to uh, to calculate optical flow. Uh, and yeah, I, I guess I'd encourage you to to maybe like try to break it. I mean, first try to try to not break it and make sure it's working. But when you are confident it's working, uh, try to try to break it. Right, like maybe point it towards some. Uh, like very textureless uh, like scene and, and see what you get or, or look at some of the, the other uh, cases that we uh, discussed. Um, so this has implications for, uh, for drones. Uh, maybe one question we can think about is uh, how should the carpet look uh, if you're, if you're uh, like working with, uh, with drones? I guess what should you, uh, how should you make your, your carpet look uh, to increase the, uh, the accuracy of uh, optical flow measurements? Yeah, stripes or, or some kind of texture, and you'll you'll often see that in, in drone videos. They have like really kind of brightly colored, uh, like almost like play mat uh, type uh, type carpets that, that people buy. Uh, yeah, I guess we we tried out uh, like with our uh, like green kind of uh, like grassy like carpets that has like enough texture uh, that the optical flow works pretty well. But if you if your ground is very uh, kind of textureless, then the drone's state estimator gets uh, like completely. Uh, wacky, uh, and we've yeah we've had that issue in our other like lab space uh, out in like Forestal where the amount of texture is not that high. If we fly drones there, we have to put like little uh, kind of like tape markers to to get a uh, good uh, state estimates from from optical flow. Um, all right, yeah, I guess any other questions? Go ahead. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So, so actually, that's one of the, the improvements you can make. Uh, and that makes a, a big improvement. So you can segment your image uh, into like different kind of spatial uh, uh, regions, uh, and then just make the spatial coherence assumption on those segments. Uh, and so you don't have this issue where uh, the assumption breaks at the, the boundary because you're doing it separately for, for each segment. Yep. Yeah, that makes a big difference. Yeah. So nowadays, uh, I guess because of GPUs, so we'll, we'll talk a bit about GPUs in the, the next lecture. Uh, because a lot of these computations are parallelizable, uh, you can speed things up quite a bit. Uh, we won't ask you to do that for, for this assignment. You'll see that when you write the code, it'll be like relatively slow. But you can speed it up uh, because everything is, is so parallelizable. And even, even the image segmentation uh, nowadays with GPUs like can run at like real time rates. So yeah, it's not a not a big issue. Good. Good. I didn't quite understand why rotating the camera doesn't work. Like, if you analyze it, like, it's like, you don't even have to rotate the camera, but rotate the image. To like yeah. Analyze it in one, like, frame, then rotate it 15 degrees, and then analyze the same image again. Like, wouldn't you be able to, like, not have the issue that you were dealing with? Oh, I see. Like, do it separately for, for a bunch of different angles? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that might work. I don't know. I guess does someone have a? Is that what you were saying initially? Okay, okay. I see. Sorry, I, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't follow it initially. Yeah, I think I think that works. I don't see a problem with that. Yeah, uh, that adds a bit of overhead, but uh, yeah, it should be fine. I guess you just find directions where there is a gradient. Uh, that would be the other way, right? Like just just find some directions where there is a gradient. Uh, kind of choose your coordinate system to match that, and then do the, the computation in that coordinate system. Yeah, I think that works as well. Yep. Good. Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't follow what you were saying before. Uh, good question. Kind of, like, it looks like it's like sampling, I don't know if it's like sampling, but like uniformly here. Uh, yeah. Is yeah. there a way to specify, like, just for certain areas that you want more? Yeah. Better? Yeah, that, that's, that's another kind of variant. So one thing you could do is, like, look at where there is a bunch of texture, uh, so some kind of, like, key, like, interest points, uh, and just do the, the computation there. Um, yeah, I think that depends on, on exactly what you're trying to do. Like, if you have a drone, I think that, that makes sense. Like, if things are, like, far away uh, from the drone and, and you know they're far away, then it doesn't really matter, like, what the optical flow there looks like. What matters is if you're, like, heading directly towards an obstacle, uh, then you really care about, uh, like, figuring out what the, the optical flow looks like uh, in that region, which can potentially allow you to uh, figure out, like, time to collision, I guess, as, as you'll see in, in this, uh, this assignment. Yeah. Yeah, yep. like, if you have multiple drones, one was like closer to an obstacle, and you knew that, and that could better measure that one. Yes. Like, like, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, all good. All good ideas. Good. Um, is there a notice of the of yes. Like yeah. Like yeah. So that that that's uh, I guess where where we're gonna go starting in the, the next lecture. I'll show you some like data sets of uh, uh, like data sets specifically for uh, like learning optical flow, and and that's uh, that kind of basically gets rid of some of the assumptions that, that we've made, right? Like these, this is a pretty like model-based approach. Like we sat down, we made some assumptions, we did some math, uh, we got an algorithm, it works pretty well, uh, but it has like flaws. Uh, so yeah, I guess we'll, we'll see how to relax some of these assumptions with learning and lots of data uh, starting the, the next lecture. Is there a trade-off when you do that with efficiency or accuracy? Is there a trade-off? Yeah, so it seems like nowadays it's, it's basically just better if you have lots and lots of data. Uh, if you don't have a ton of data, then baking in some of this extra knowledge can, uh, can make a big difference. Yep. All right, I guess I'll see you next week then. <laughs>